Hello there, my name is Ryan, and it's been a while since I've done one of these board game videos, but today is something a bit special. I have a copy of Puzzle Strike 2 by Serlin Games, and I'm going to be walking you through like what comes in the box and how to play and all that sort of stuff, which is pretty cool. Now, this is, um, as of the time of this video, this is up on Kickstarter, so this isn't a final production copy, this is actually a prototype. So. Um, most of the components look pretty good, but there are a couple things that will be different in the final version. For example, like the scepter will look different, the gems will be much more colorblind friendly, they'll be different individual shapes, they'll have sparkles that'll like look really cool. But uh, with that out of the way, let's go through how to set this up for your first game. So yep. in the box, you'll get four copies each of these two individual player boards, and each player who's playing should take one of each of them. Next, each player needs to choose a character. The base box for Puzzle Strike 2 comes with 10 different characters, and each character has three different cards each. So for example, if you wanted to play as Valerie, you would take these three cards, as denoted by the text in the lower corner. By the way, all of these characters have been featured in previous Serlin games, so if you've already played the other Serlin games, you might already know which character is your favorite. Each player's starting deck consists of 10 cards, those 10 cards are their three character cards, two crash gems, two swap cards, two basic blocks, and a skip ahead. Players should shuffle their starting deck, place it in the designated spot on their player board, and then draw a starting hand of five cards. In addition, you'll also start with two incoming gems that you'll place into your incoming gem zone. Next, you'll randomly determine which player goes first. If you are not the first player, you'll start the game with a diamond, but if you are the first player, you'll start the game with the Scepter of Power. We'll discuss the Scepter in depth a little later in the video. Now once each player has set up their individual boards, you'll place this central board within reach of all the players. The base box for Puzzle Strike 2 comes with these two decks, and you might even have more decks if you have expansions, but for your very first game you'll be using the Grand Melee deck. The cards for the Grand Melee deck are denoted by this icon in the lower corner. So you'll shuffle the Grand Melee deck, you'll place it here on the central board, and then you'll deal out the top five cards of the deck into these slots here. Then you'll take the two anti-up cards, and you'll place them into the deck depending on the number of players. So for example, in a three-player game, you would place them after every 12 cards in the deck. Lastly, you'll place the wound cards into the wound slot, and you'll place the gems and the energy tokens and the incoming gem tokens within easy reach of all the players. And now you should be all set up to play your first game of Puzzle Strike 2. So before we get into the specific rules and the turn phases and all of that, let's give a quick overview of like what does the game feel like to play. In Puzzle Strike 2, you'll win or lose based on the gems that are in your gem pile. Each turn, more and more gems will fall into your gem pile, and if you ever end your turn with 11 or more gems in your gem pile, then that will trigger the end of the game. Now from hearing that description, you might think, oh well what I want to do is I want to have as few gems in my gem pile as possible. But that's also not quite true. In Puzzle Strike 2, your gems are not just your lose condition, they're also how you attack other players. If you can group together gems of matching colors, then you can crash them at your opponents to send gems over to them. Also, having gems in your gem pile can give you big bonuses, and crashing gems at your opponents can give you access to powerful super moves. In addition, the player who holds the scepter will build up super moves even faster than the others, but they may regret it if they hold the scepter for too long. Now let's get into the actual specifics of the turn structure. First is the ante phase. At the start of your turn, you'll take a look at whatever card is in the ante slot on the central board, and you'll add two gems to your gem pile that match that color. After the ante phase is the action phase. During the action phase, you'll take three of these action tokens, which you can spend to play cards out of your hand. To play a card, you'll pay its cost in the upper corner, and then you'll do whatever the card says in the order that it's written on the card. A lot of the cards use specific icons, so we'll go through a bunch of example cards to kind of show you how everything works. This is the crash icon. When you play a crash, three things happen. First, 
Crashing lets you get gems out of your gem pile. Second, crashing gems powers up your super meter. And third, crashing sends incoming gems over to your opponents. So for example, let's say you have just one gem in your gem pile. When you crash that gem, you'll remove that gem from your gem pile, you'll place it in the color matched super meter, and then you'll send an incoming gem over to your opponents. Now for another example, let's say that your gem pile looked like this. Now when you play a crash, you'll get to crash all three of these blue gems since they're in a row of matching colors on the top of your gem pile. Even better, notice this little bonus on the side. Whenever you crash two or more gems, you get to send extra gems to your opponent based on this height bonus that's listed on the side of your gem pile. So three gems plus a height bonus of two, which means you send five incoming gems over to your opponent. Crashing three gems also means that you would add all three of those gems over into your super meter. If you ever have four or more gems in your super meter, you trigger a super move. Each super meter has four spaces and you'll never overpay for a super. So if you already had three gems in your super meter and you got another three more from crashing, then you would do the action listed under that super move and you would still have two gems remaining in your super meter. Once per game, you can also activate a super move by spending a diamond. Now, if you don't have the scepter, then you will always send your incoming gems to whichever player does have the scepter. But if you do have the scepter, you'll send your incoming gems to all other players simultaneously. Now note that when you crash, you always have to crash the top gem of your gem pile along with any other matching gems. So if your gem pile looks like this, you would have to crash just the one single green gem. However, some cards have a special kind of crash called a deep crash, which lets you crash any group that's in your gem pile. Note that when you do this, you only get the height bonus for that specific stack of gems. The next icon we'll look at is the swap icon. The swap icon lets you exchange the places of any two adjacent gems in your gem pile. So for example, if your gem pile looked like this, you could play your swap card to swap once, twice, and you could crash three gems instead of just one gem. You might also see this deep swap icon, which allows you to swap any two gems in your gem pile and not just gems that are adjacent to each other. Block icons let you remove incoming gems. So if you played this card, you would get to take three of your incoming gems and put them back in the supply. But if you can't block all of your incoming gems, then you'll have to drop them at some point during your action phase. So let's take a look at how that works. When incoming gems fall into your gem pile, they'll match the colors of the drop pattern on the central board. So for example, if you had four incoming gems and the bank looked like this, you would add a pink gem, a green gem, another green gem, and then a purple gem. You can choose to drop gems at any point during your action phase, and dropping gems doesn't cost an action. So for example, you could play a crash, and then you could drop gems. Or you could do it the other way around. You could drop gems and then play a crash, whichever you prefer. But know that when you drop gems, you have to drop all of the gems that you can. And so if your board looked like this, and you decided to drop gems, you would have to drop all four of these gems. However, if your board looked like this when you decided to drop gems, you would only be able to drop six of your incoming gems, since that's all you would have space for, and the rest would stay in your incoming gem zone. That also means that you could drop gems multiple times in the same turn, since you could potentially drop gems and then play crashes or something to clear them out, and then drop gems again. By the way, when you add more than five gems to your gem pile, you just loop back around. And so after you added this blue gem as your fifth gem, you would go back to the beginning again and your sixth gem would be pink. Now let's take a look at a couple more symbols. This lightning symbol means that you get an extra action. So footwork costs one action, but it gives you back two actions. This green plus card icon means that you get to draw a card. So Adrenaline Rush would let you draw three cards. Similarly, this red minus icon means you have to discard a card. This top icon lets you take any card out of the bank and add it to the top of your draw pile. 
This trash icon means that you have to trash the card once you've played it. There are also these tag icons, but we'll get to those when we talk about the buy phase. You might also notice that some cards mention unblockable crashes. Unblockable crashes don't send incoming gems to their opponents. Instead, those gems fall directly into their gem pile, following the same drop pattern order. You'll also see some of these horizontally formatted cards called creatures. When you play a creature, you'll place it in your creature slot here, and its ability will stay active until one of your opponents crashes at least this many gems of this color. You only have one creature spot on your board, so if you end up wanting to play another one, you'll have to discard any creatures you already have to play a new creature. And then once you're finished playing cards out of your hand, that'll end your action phase. You'll drop any remaining incoming gems that you have left, and then you'll move on to the buy phase. During the buy phase, you'll gain exactly one card from the bank, and you'll add it to your discard pile. However, you have to also pay the card's cost listed underneath the card. So if you wanted to buy this card here, you would pay for it by adding three incoming gems to your board. Cards that have this tag icon will either increase or decrease the cost of your buy. So for example, if you had played Barrier Block during your action phase, then you would only need to pay one incoming gem for this card instead of three. After you've bought a card, then you move on to the draw phase. During the draw phase, you discard all of the cards that are left in your hand, and you draw a new hand of five cards. However, depending on your gem pile, you'll draw some bonus cards. So for example, if your gem pile looked like this, your height bonus would be two, and so you would draw an extra two cards, or you would draw seven cards in total. And then for the last phase, we're going to have to talk a little bit more in depth about the Scepter of Power. At any point during the game, there will be one player who holds the Scepter, and that player has a couple of special rules. First off, as mentioned before, whenever the player with the Scepter crashes gems, they crash gems at every other opponent. In fact, Whenever the player with the scepter does anything that affects their opponent, such as this purple super move here, it affects every other player. Secondly, the player with the scepter can choose to power up by adding a gem to each of their super meters. However, holding the scepter does come with some drawbacks. Not only do you target everyone else, but every other player when they crash or when they do things to their opponent will also target you. In addition, while you hold the scepter, at the beginning of your action phase, you always have to drop your incoming gems. In addition, while you can still play block cards, your block cards won't block incoming gems. And so at the end of each opponent's turn, this is a decision. You get to either power up all of your super meters, or you can give the scepter to that player. Also, a quick note on super moves. If you're holding the scepter and you're powering up on other players' turns, there is the chance that you'll trigger a super move when it's not your turn. If you trigger Overload or Purify, just do what they say. If you trigger Energize, take the two extra action tokens and draw the two extra cards, and when it comes back around to your turn, you'll have those two extra actions to spend. Similarly, if you trigger Trick Shot, you'll take a card from the bank, and then it'll be free to play when it comes back around to your turn again. Now, as you play the game, you'll be buying cards out of the bank and all of this sort of thing, and eventually one of the cards that comes up will be this anti-up card. Just take it and place it above the anti-slot on the board. The anti-up card does two things. It adds plus one to the anti, so at the beginning of every turn, you'll add one extra gem to your gem pile. It also adds one extra action, so at the beginning of your action phase, you'll take an extra action token, and you'll have that extra action to spend. So now that you understand the individual turn phases, let's put it all together, and we'll go through an example turn of Puzzle Strike 2. In this example, it's DeGray's turn. DeGray is playing in a three-player game against Geiger and Setsuki, and Setsuki holds the scepter. DeGray starts with the anti phase and adds two pink gems to their gem pile. Next, DeGray takes three action tokens and begins their action phase. If DeGray decided to drop their incoming gems now, they would be blue and green, but DeGray has a better idea. For their first action, DeGray plays one of their character cards, Search for Truth. 
Search for Truth allows DeGray to trash a card from the bank, moving it into the trash pile, and then they refill the bank and they get to rearrange the drop pattern. So DeGray rearranges the bank cards to move the two pink cards to the front of the drop pattern. With the bank rearranged, DeGray now decides to drop their two incoming gems following the drop pattern, which creates a group of four pink gems in a row. Now DeGray spends their second action to play a swap card, which allows DeGray to swap adjacent gems two times. DeGray swaps the pink gem with the green gem, then swaps that same pink gem with the blue gem, and creates a group of five pink gems in a row. Now that DeGray has a large group of matching gems, they play Gut Punch, which allows them to crash all five of those pink gems. Since DeGray doesn't have the scepter, DeGray sends those five incoming gems to the player who does have the scepter, which is Satsuki, and they also send an additional two incoming gems due to the height bonus, for a total of seven gems. DeGray also moves those five gems from their gem pile into their pink super meter, which is enough to trigger a super move. DeGray removes four pink gems from their super meter and triggers Energize, which gives DeGray two extra actions and two extra cards. So DeGray takes two more action tokens from the supply and draws two more cards from the deck. DeGray then spends their last two actions to play the Wise Pig creature and places it in their creature slot. After that, DeGray moves on to the buy phase, and DeGray buys Footwork. This buy would normally be free, but because DeGray played Gut Punch during their action phase, the cost for Footwork is increased by two, and so to buy it, they add two incoming gems to their gem pile, and they add Footwork into their discard pile. Then for the draw phase, DeGray discards all of the cards left in their hand, and they draw five cards, plus one extra card due to the height bonus of their gem pile. And last is the command decision. Since Setsuki has the scepter, Setsuki can decide to either power up or they can give the scepter to DeGray. The Setsuki player decides to keep the scepter and adds a gem to each of their super meters. Players continue taking turns like this until one player ends their turn with 11 or more gems in their gem pile. When that happens, that triggers the end of the game. Now in a two-player game, Whoever triggered the end of the game loses, and the other player wins. But in a three- or four-player game, instead, you'll count up all of your gems, including the gems in your gem pile and your incoming gems. Then each other player will get one last turn, and at the end of each of their turns, they'll also count all the gems in their gem pile and their incoming gems. Then whoever had the least number of gems at the end of their last turn is the player that wins the game. And hopefully that should be plenty to get you started playing Puzzle Strike 2. Have fun, and enjoy the game!